Hello and welcome to the Oxford University Museum of Natural History. Wildlife Warriors and Women promises to be a really fascinating and inspiring way for us all to mark International Women's Day together. The role of women scientists in developing our understanding of the natural world has historically been overlooked and those of you who've been here in the museum in Oxford will have noticed a, conspic a conspicuous lack of women in the statues of significant scientific thinkers, which were erected by the Victorians around the inside of our main court downstairs here. We don't have to dig too deeply though to find stories of intrepid, intelligent female scientists from throughout the centuries who furthered our knowledge of the natural world. And uh, in your joining instructions email, you may have noticed a link at the bottom to an online version of our museum trail, Shout Out for Women in Science, which tells just a few of these inspiring stories. It's well worth a look if you have a second. Uh, and talking of intrepid, inspiring women scientists, I think it's time that we met tonight's speaker. Introducing Dr. Amy Dickman in a, a short space of time is no mean feat. With over 80 papers and book chapters, her list of publications alone would take up most of tonight's event. Amy has over 20 years experience working on large carnivore ecology and conservation in Africa. And in 2009, she set up the Ruaha Carnivore Project in Tanzania. Through this project, she has worked closely with warriors and women in rural communities to minimize human carnivore conflict and has achieved vital conservation successes in the Ruaha landscape, which now supports nearly 10% of the world's remaining lions. Amy is Kaplan Senior Research Fellow in Field Conservation here at the University of Oxford. Uh, she's a member of the IUCN CAT Specialist Group. She's a uh, member of the Human Wildlife Conflict Collaboration, the African Lion Working Group, the IUCN Human Wildlife Conflict Task Force, and somehow she's fitted in time to be a National Geographic Explorer and a founding member of Pride Lion Alliance. She's received multiple awards for her work, including 2020 National Geographic Women of Impact Award. So I'm sure you will be as excited as we are to welcome Amy and to hear her lecture this evening. Hello, Amy. Hi there, thank you very much. Lovely to be here. Uh, yeah, it's very wonderful to be able to share with you in person. It'd be really nice to be at the museum tonight, but it's such an honor to be talking to you today. So I'm gonna go into my talk now. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the background of our work in Tanzania, and then I'm gonna particularly explore the role of women in conservation, and particularly in this field of lion conservation. I've been lucky enough to work with some incredibly inspiring women. So I'm just gonna share my screen with you. Okay, can you guys see that? Can someone let me know if you can see that? Yeah, that's working well, thank you. Great, thanks. Laura. All right, so I'm going to be talking, as Laura said, about wildlife, warriors, and women. So, our big cat work in Tanzania and beyond as well. Now, big cats and particularly lions have always been central to human culture. They have fascinated people literally since the dawn of humankind. And we can see this if we go back millennia of human evolution, human culture. So, for instance, the very first figurative art that humans carved out of woolly mammoth ivory about 40,000 years ago, it's shown on the left here, it's the head of a lion on a human body. And it just shows right at the beginning when people wanted to depict what was amazing about the world, even then they chose a lion. The same kind of thing can be seen in the cave art that we find in France that was drawn over 30,000 years ago. This has extensive depictions of lions and just amazing tableau representing the very sorts of behavior that we would find if you looked out on the Serengeti today with the notable exception that the females, sorry, the males then didn't appear to have mates. So right the way, as soon as we've been able to express ourselves, lions in particular and big cats in general have really occupied a very special space in human culture, just in everything that it means to be human. And that has really continued through the ages. They are represented on everything from the door knocker of 10 Downing Street to either the UK's national symbol. They are on everything from luxury sports brands to snacks. So that really has resonated for people. And the same was true for me. I have always been fascinated by big cats and particularly by lions for no particular reason. I grew up in Devon. Um, the biggest I had was a fairly antagonistic moggy. But you know, these animals just really spoke to me and I would go to the zoo and I would stare at them for hours and my family would be completely bored. But I always knew that I really sort of was just wanted to do something with lions. And in fact, my brother and I dug up a memory box that he and I had buried at the age I was 10 at the time. And in it, we talked about what we wanted to do at the then unimaginable age of 30. And in it, I had two things on my list. 
I said I wanted to be out in the Serengeti studying lions, and I wanted to have a zebra striped Land Rover, which I still haven't managed to achieve and is definitely still on that life list to try and tick off. And when these things evolved beyond just being a 10 year old, I started to think more about how I can actually make this dream become a reality. And it's something I say now to lots, particularly of younger women students coming up and school children, I'll say to them, follow your dreams because you know, this can come true for you. I, I had many um, lecturers, even at university and school teachers who would say, you want to work on big cats. So what do you really want to do? Because no one does that. And I thought someone's got to do it. And when I looked around, the most viable option for working on big cats was actually working with the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit right here at Oxford University. And I was inspired by this, particularly by the founder, David McDonald. It seemed to me that literally as soon as you walked into Wild Crew, you got handed a big cat to study. So I saw inspiring pictures of David with Andy here with a lion, David with a cheetah, Arjun with a tiger, Muhammad with a leopard. There was these amazing people doing amazing work. Um, and I was lucky enough to get, I did a zoology degree. And I was lucky enough after that to get a graduate scholarship to Wild Crew. And I walked in there and I was so excited to see which big cat I would be given to basically go out and make my, my reputation and my fortune on. And David said, yes, the study animal we've picked for you is the water shrew. Now this is the biggest of the shrews, but it still is about 15,000 times more than a lion. So I wasn't that impressed, but I thought, okay, everyone's got to put their time in. So I started working on water shrews. I say working on, I don't actually believe they exist in the UK because I've never saw one in my months tramping up and down canals. But anyway, things finally, I clearly proved my worth to some extent with the water shrews because things got much bigger and scarier when I was promoted to working on water voles. Um, this was going fairly well again, you know, something having to do some time. But I kept moaning to David that I wanted to do more. And eventually things got properly scary with an actual carnivore involved. So I helped a little bit with the badger work that was happening in Whiteham. And then by now I was getting a bit fed up. David had suggested I do a PhD on water voles. I wasn't that excited by it. Um, and I said, well, I really want to go out to Africa. That's, you know, I need to get out there and get some experience. And at the time, Cambridge had an opportunity for students to go out and work on on their meerkat project. And I thought, well, it's not cats, it's, you know, it's not big cats, but still it sounds quite similar. I might be able to fool a few people and at least it gets me African experience. So I told David, and of course, Oxford hates losing people to Cambridge. And he said, no, no, we've got this woman joining, uh, Laurie Marker, and she works in Namibia on cheetahs. Would you like to work on cheetahs? And I said, absolutely, I would. So I headed off to Namibia to work with Laurie and it was meant to be a six month placement. It ended up being six years and it was just a spectacular, amazing time out there. I mean, I learned a huge amount from Laurie. She's a hugely inspiring woman, should be recognized today of all days. And we learned all sorts of things about conflict and far beyond the actual ecology of the, the animals themselves. But I still had this hankering to get out to East Africa in particular. And then I was lucky enough to meet Sarah Durant from the Serengeti Cheetah Project, another inspiring woman, and headed out with her to see the work that they were doing in Serengeti. And literally this was like all the dreams were coming true at once. You would drive out from this beautiful lodge. Uh, your study animal would just arrive on your car with seemingly little effort. People were very worried about safety in the field. Hydration in the field was a big concern, as is important. So I was really pleased to see they took these things seriously. This was actually my 30th birthday in Serengeti. So ticking off that, that sort of childhood dream of being out there on my 30th is quite exciting. This is actually a work photo because there's a cheetah right there in the grass behind the champagne bottle. I was like, this is amazing. You know, everything's come exactly as I wanted it to be. And then Sarah said, do you want to do your PhD with me? I said, absolutely. And so I signed all the relevant forms. And then she said, right, drive for 24 hours in that direction until you hit a swamp. And I was like, why? Why do I have to leave Ro um, Serengeti? It's lovely. You said, oh, there are far too many people working in Serengeti. We need people working in Ruaha. I'd never heard of Ruaha, but I rather sullenly drove a long way south. And this ancient Land Rover had to be rescued by Catholic nuns on the way. And finally arrived <coughs> in Ruaha. So this is literally as far as you could drive. This is the Great Ruaha River. And this was my tent, uh, the beginning of my field camp there, very different from the lodges we've been staying in, in Serengeti. And on the very first night there, I have to say, this huge male lion came and slept right on this tent, almost crushed me. There's a story about it on the Nat Geo website. And it was one of the most deeply terrifying moments of my life. But it really made me think, wow, you know, OK, I've kind of arrived. This is what I wanted, even if I was sort of doubting it in that moment. And it wasn't just about Sarah being mean or trying to trying to sort of push me out or anything. Really, Ruaha is an incredibly important place for large carnivores. 
It is a global hotspot for many species, everything from endangered African wild dogs to cheetahs, and one of the most significant places left for lions. And there was very, very little research or conservation attention focused there. There was no specific carnivore research project. So it was a huge opportunity to start working in this really important landscape and understand what was happening there and the threats to wildlife. So large carnivores are hugely important for many reasons. They have really important ecological value. If you know if you have big apex carnivores in an ecosystem, that the rest of the food pyramid underneath the rest of the ecosystem is healthy. And so it's an indicator of having a sort of a healthy um, natural system. So it's really important to have those there to play that role in regulating prey species and representing that wider ecosystem health. Large carnivores are also really important economically in many of the countries in which they occur, many of which are very, very poor. So the presence of large carnivores, particularly for things like phototourism or trophy hunting, is an important way of generating revenue for local governments and local stakeholders. And beyond all of that, it's just really important existence value. So even if you never get to be you know, lucky enough to get out to Africa and to see these incredible animals, people still just want to know they live in a world that is still wild enough to have lions and tigers and wolves and bears out there. I think that's hugely important. But despite all that value that we ascribe to large carnivores, we have not done a very good job of conserving them. So things like cheetahs are under immense threat. They've disappeared from over 90% of their historic range. The same is true for African wild dogs. There are only thought to be six viable populations left, one of which is in Ruaha. And for lions, people are absolutely horrified when you say to people that there are now fewer wild lions left than rhinos. This incredibly iconic animal, that one that we saw carved out of woolly mammoth ivory, is disappearing at an alarming rate. They've gone from around 92% of their range. There are somewhere around 22 and a half thousand lions left. Um, and there are only five big populations left. So a big number of the remaining lions are actually in small fragmented populations that are very unlikely to persist long term. And another thing that people don't realize is that while lions rely heavily on protected areas, a significant percentage of their range is actually outside formerly protected areas on land dominated by people. So you cannot conserve lions without doing it in partnership with local people. And the key threats to them, the drivers for this decline, are the loss of habitat, the loss of wild prey and conflict with local people. So when we look at uh, lion range, this sort of brown colour shows you where lions used to occur through Africa, pretty um, joined up range right the way through, apart from at the Congo Basin and south of the Sahara. And if you look at our latest mapping, this is roughly where we think they are right now. And as I mentioned, a lot of these light blue areas of the smaller populations, they're very fragmented, they're very small. The most important country by far for lions is Tanzania. So that's down here, it has around 40% of the world's lions. And there are two really significant populations as well, Ruaha, which is right down here in the center of the country, and the Salu landscape, which is thought to have the biggest lion population left in the world. So in both these landscapes, as in many other places, lions don't just rely on the core protected areas, although those are really important. They also rely on the same land as extremely poor subsistence farmers. And we're not just talking about slightly poor, these people are in real, real poverty. So 90% of people live on less than $2 a day, and 60% of people live on less than a dollar a day. 45% of people are undernourished, and two thirds of people have no access to clean water or any form of improved sanitation. So diseases like cholera and giardia are endemic. Half the local households are unable to meet their daily food needs. So food insecurity is a massive issue. And there's very little access to Western medical care, to good medical care, and the life expectancy is around 50 years old. So these people are really in these desperate situations. And when you look at literacy as one of the ways of maybe getting out of this, a quarter of the male household heads, so these are the most empowered people in the community, have no basic literacy at all. And when you look at female household heads, three quarters of the women have no literacy at all. So this really traps them in poverty and they're very restricted in terms of future options to be able to get out of the cycle of poverty. And then you put these very vulnerable people living cheek by jowl with some of the most important large carnivore populations left on the planet. And it's very important to note that one of the reasons that Tanzania is so important is because its protected areas aren't fenced. So it just bleeds straight into the community land. And that means that the lions and the other wildlife move easily across those areas, but they can come into significant conflict with local people. So for instance, this man had three cattle. Uh, one of them was killed by a, a lion. 
He was obviously devastated by it because it really affected his household wealth. He then poisoned the carcass and three lions were killed. So this is a really devastating, but really common, unfortunately, situation that we see. And when I was doing my master's and my PhD around Ruaha, I was looking at the extent of conflict. And people kept saying, look, we don't like these animals. We, they threaten us. They're scary, but we don't kill them. And I thought, I just don't really believe that. If I was you, I'd be killing them. And so after my PhD and my master's, I went back there and through a fellowship at Oxford, at Wildcrew, I set up the Ruaha Carnival Project. And the aim was to really better understand the depths of the conflict and whether it was having real uh, conservation impacts in this huge but very understudied landscape. So the first thing to do is to set up our field camp. Um, this is looking out directly onto the national park. As I mentioned, it's unfenced. This is about eight kilometers from the border. And it's just, it's a beautiful, beautiful area. Lots of wildlife around. And we decided much as it would be nice to actually live in the park and enjoy sort of the gin and tonics and things like that. It was really vital that we based ourselves on community land so that we could understand which pressures the, the local people were experiencing and better just really get to the heart of their conflicts with local wildlife. So we set up the field camp. It took about 20 minutes. It was myself and two Tanzanians. Um, my tent is in the front there. And, you know, this was great. It was very basic. There was no running water. There's no electricity for several years. Um, we still don't have running water today. But, you know, it was all good, apart from the fact there was a leopard that lived in the bush just behind uh, the tent on the left, which we discovered we just had to have a bit of a timeshare about. So we had the day, she had the night, all good unless you needed to pee in the middle of the night. And it went horribly wrong. But anyway, we stayed there and this was kind of um, where we set up our very basic camp. This is my uh, ensuite bathroom where you can see the bucket shower, there's a pit toilet. It was all pretty basic, but enabled us to be there and to be living amongst the people affected. This was Project HQ and still is to this day. Um, and our main aim of really living out there was to see was this conflict that we were hearing about translating into a real conservation concern. And in short, the answer was absolutely yes. Until we lived there on the village land, we had no clue of the extent of carnival killing that was happening. So these were animals that we discovered just within the first year of our work. And it was often literally just walking through the bush and you would smell something, they clearly died, you'd go and investigate. And there'd be several lions lying dead. There'd be other animals there, animals poisoned, speared, snared. And the amount of killing was absolutely devastating. We believe it is the highest recorded rate of lion killing in modern times anywhere in East Africa. And two things jumped out at us in addition to the sheer numbers of animals being killed. The first was that an awful lot of the animals were missing their right front paw. That was often the only body part that was taken. We had no idea what on earth was going on. The second was that a lot of the animals were heavily pregnant females. And there is no quick way of driving a population uh, down to extirpation or extinction if you take out the reproductively active females. So we knew this was a huge conservation concern. So obviously, it was key to understand quite why this amount of killing was going on. When we talked to local people, they all said, you've got to talk to the Barabig. Now, most people have never heard of the Barabig. They're a tribe that is a sister tribe to the Maasai. But unlike the Maasai, which are globally famous, the Barabig are extremely secretive, extremely hostile. They wear black instead of red. And they are very antagonistic, basically, at dealing with any outsiders. So for years, literally years, we tried to engage with the Barabig. We tried to have community meetings. We tried to go to their households and talk with them. People would run away into the bush. Uh, we had all kinds of really, really crazy difficulties trying to actually break in, have people listen to us at all. They were very hostile and thought that we were just there to try to prioritise wildlife conservation over their needs. Eventually, we ended up putting up a solar panel at camp. This is about two years into the project. We were really quite desperate. We put up a solar, can solar panel at camp to charge our laptops. And then suddenly the Barabig arrived to charge their mobile phones. And it still kills me to this day that I didn't think of this early on, because the very last thing that any one of us would give up in the bush is our mobile phones. And it's the same for the Barabay. They use them for everything from tracking livestock prices to reporting if livestock go missing in the bush. So this is a really important part for them. And before we set up our helpful little charging station, they were having to walk off from 15 or maybe 20 kilometers to charge their phones. So this was great. They would come, they would charge and they would sit around. It wasn't an immediate breakthrough, but it enabled them to just watch us for a while and recognize us as not being this enemy and learn a little bit more about what we were trying to do. And eventually this led to us having a meeting with the local warriors who said, we really just want to understand your perspective on this. So we met with them, we had a great community meeting. We said to them, we are not the wildlife division, we are not the police, we are not the authorities, we're not here to cause problems for you. 
But what we're trying to do is understand why you're killing this number of lions and how, if there's a different way that you could achieve whatever you achieved through it, you know, in a more conservation friendly way. So everyone was very happy, aided in large part by this immense amount of home brewed banana beer they bought, which really does help any uh, meeting I find. And we walked away and this was the happiest moment for the project. That evening when we walked away and we thought, God, this is really just the height of it. We have finally got through with the Barabay. They say they're going to work with us. And within four days of that project, of that meeting, those young men went out and they killed seven lions right around camp. And this was the lowest part of the project. We really, I remember crying and just thinking, God, we are never going to get there. You know, they're literally throwing everything back in our faces. And so we I called up a really good friend of mine, Leela, who I'll talk a little bit more about later, who runs Lion Guardians in Kenya and said, I don't know what to do. I'm at the end of my tether. I'm just going to give up on it all because we cannot work with these people. And she said, they are testing you. She said, you have told them what you value. You value lions. You value wildlife. You've also said you're going to work with the community. So right here, the community are killing the lions to see if you will turn against them. And it was such good advice. And it comes back later when we think about advice and sharing experiences and stuff in the field, because she said, you've got to do nothing. We did nothing. And sure enough, a week later, they came and they invited us down to their community meeting in the bush. And they said, now we want to work with you. We will tell you and trust you about how what it's like to live with these animals. And it worked out there were four key reasons that people were doing this immense amount of killing. The first one, the most obvious one, was a tax on livestock. On average, this was costing people about 18% of their annual cash income. And more importantly, I'd say even by those attacks, though, was that people got few or no benefits from the presence of wildlife. And the very few benefits that were there were inequitably distributed. So people, the only people say who benefited from tourism were in the one village close to the, the gateway into the park. So the people who were suffering the costs out in the bush were not getting any of the benefits. A thirdly, a really important uh, aspect that we would never have picked up on if we hadn't talked to the warriors, but these cultural issues about money and status. So the young men said that when they go out on a lion hunt, the first man who throws the spear that first hits the lion gets to be the one that cuts off this right front paw. And then they take this central claw and they wear it on, an, on one of these armbands you can see here. They go to the witch doctor, they talk to them about uh, how many households they can go around to. And they go around to all these households and they get gifts of cattle for being as brave and a, you know, a good warrior. So this gives them money in the community, it gives them status and it gives them the attention of women. So all of these things were really important to understand. And the last fact is just a real lack of conservation awareness. People didn't realize that Ruaha was such a hotspot. And they didn't know that what they were doing was having any negative conservation value at all, because, of course, the you know, lions were so, so common there. So we learned all of this. And it was a real, it was really sort of a breakthrough of having these discussions, but we felt a bit daunted on how to deal with it. So we started with the only thing we did know, which is how to reduce attacks. So we worked with people's livestock enclosures. Two thirds of attacks were happening in poorly constructed livestock enclosures. Um, and so we reinforced them with wire. These look rubbish. If you went to a zoo and this was their lion enclosure, you would obviously report them. But these have actually been really effective. They've reduced attacks on enclosed stock and these by about 95 percent. So that's been really, really good. But it's no use just keeping the stock safely at night and then releasing them in the morning to slightly hungrier predators. So we knew we needed to deal with um, mm. guarding dogs with um, stock out in the day as well. And that's when we work with communities to talk about guarding dogs. And for a long time, people were very resistant to the idea. And then I remember once we were having this community meeting and we were sitting there with some of the villagers and one of our dogs, our camp dogs, came up and was getting in the way. So we told the dog to sit in Swahili and amazingly the dog sat and the entire meeting ground to a halt. And we said, what? And they said, where did you get the Swahili speaking dog? And we said, well, what do you mean? It's just a dog. It's just a village dog. And they said, your dog speaks Swahili. It is magic. We said, well, actually, we usually speak to them in English. And they said, English, your dog speaks English. And it just totally derailed our meeting. But everyone was fascinated. You could actually work with dogs and talk to them and communicate. Despite everyone having them, they'd never really tried that. So that opened our sort of reputation as being dog whisperers. And finally, we got to bring in some real magic dogs. These are Anatolian shepherds from CCF and Namibia from Laurie, who I used to work with. And uh, we brought over 10 of them just as initial pilot trials. It's very hard to get donors to fund bringing cute puppies if they think they might be eaten by lions. But we brought the dogs out and, you know, it was, it was a success. When you show this to a farmer, they're like, are you joking? Have you seen a lion? It's massive. That looks like a canopy. But actually, they grow up to be very big, sometimes too big. So now we're looking at maybe crossbreeding or using local dogs to get the same care and the attention as these guardian dogs. So we knew we could protect livestock, but it was much, much more important 
to actually provide the benefits. We had extensive community meetings with everyone to say, which benefits would you most appreciate from having wildlife on your land? And the top three priorities were education, veterinary medicine, and um, healthcare. The same sort of things probably any one of us would pick. So we started in each of these programs for education. We have twinned um, international schools in the US or the UK with a local village school because these schools had nothing. And so we provide books, chairs, desks, blackboards, whatever. And this has been really, really important at helping get children get a decent sort of education at school. Um, we also then realized that we can't just prioritize primary school education. So we started a scholarship program to send children uh, all the way through a fully funded scholarship through secondary school. This was the only time that we ever went against the community and it's very relevant for today because the community said we love the scholarship program but we don't want any girls to get it because girls are a waste of time they get pregnant they get married and we fought against that and we said half of the scholarships must go to girls and so now interestingly over time the uptake of these by girls has really increased in the last year five out of the six scholarships we gave were to girls and we've now started a college program and we are finding that those girls are doing very well and they're going on to college as well. So it's really important to show locally that the girls can really sort of take this forward and be valuable with an education you know, in a way they didn't actually think they could be before. We then found out that still people weren't able to get to sort of pass the grades they needed to get into the secondary school despite the equipment at the primary school. So then we worked with the school teachers and we said, what else is needed? What's the barrier here? And they said it's nutrition because these children are walking long distances in the morning. They don't have you know, breakfast at home. They don't have any way of eating at school. So therefore they're hungry all day and that really affects their, their concentration. So we started a porridge project with three local schools where we feed around a thousand children every day. And this has been probably one of the most valued projects locally because people know their child will get a good meal if they go to school. And then therefore their attainment goes up and the education has gone up a lot as well. We also work with healthcare, particularly with the women. We focus a lot on equipping clinics and focusing on maternal and neonatal healthcare, simple things like umbilical clips, training of people to use you know, safe equipment. We work with the local midwives so that women can give birth safely. This was a huge driver that women said, I just wanna be able to give birth off the floor and you know, and be able to get through that what can be a very dangerous experience more safely. For veterinary medicine, this was a hugely important thing because people were losing nine times as much livestock to disease as they were to attacks on livestock on by carnivores. So we worked with the communities, we gave them veterinary medicines, and people liked all of this stuff. It was great. They would wave to us, we felt pretty good about ourselves. So for about three or four years, we, we thought this was all going pretty well. But then we discovered, of course, people were taking the benefits, and they were, of course, still killing the carnivores, so why wouldn't you? And at the same time, we were trying to camera track out there for understanding the ecology of wildlife, and people were stealing the camera traps because they didn't get invested. So we thought, well, this isn't going quite to plan because what's happening is that the people are seeing the benefits associated with the project rather than actually the wildlife itself. So to change that around, we started something we call community camera trapping, where the communities themselves manage and run the camera traps, they put them out there. And through a very long process with the communities, we've come up with a system where um, they get a certain number of points for each wild animal that they, that they um, camera trap on their village land. And so, for instance, we, we want more points to go for animals that are more dangerous, cause more conflict. So an animal like a dick dick will get you a thousand points. So it's a very small, innocuous animal. By the way, at the beginning, I wanted to start with a simple system of one to five points. I was told I was way too cheap and I wanted millions of points. So fine. So dick dick will get you a thousand points. A primate um, will get you 1500 points. They often go around in large troops, obviously, so you can get many points for, for one animal because it's per individual animal that gets the points. So here the impala and the baboon will give you two and a half thousand points. We give more for carnivores. So the spotted hyena will get you 10,000 points. Um, the lion, 15,000 points. And the top spot is the endangered African wild dog at 20,000 points. And this immediately transformed views towards it. Worth noting that this picture, um, because it's per individual, got the community 340,000 points and straight away, the community recognized that this waterhole, which used to be a key area for snaring and sometimes for poisoning, was worth protecting because they were getting so many points for their program. This will get you zero points, although it's a very common picture that you will get anywhere in the world, you put young men, alcohol and camera traps. But every three months, these points get translated into additional healthcare, education and veterinary benefits to the community. So it really has changed it. People now recognize 
that by conserving the wildlife is what gets the benefits, not to do with the project itself. We're just a mechanism for translating that value of wildlife down to tangible benefits that matter to the community. And this means that wildlife in this local area is now a major driver in development. And this is where in particular women have been hugely important. The women have helped drive the healthcare programme, the education programme. And we have seen that when, for instance, young men want to go out and kill lions, it has been the women that has pulled them back. We could never do that. We don't have the role to do it locally. But we found groups of women would actually call those young men back and they would say, you are killing the very thing that is enabling us to educate our children and give birth safely and we are not having it. So the women themselves have put on bands in lion and elephant hunting in some of these villages. And so they've taken a really active role so they've recognised the benefits there. And that's amazingly important to see them taking it on with no interaction with us at all. Um, you can't just rely on the women. The young men here, as we've touched on, are very, very important because of this cultural aspect of lion hunting. So we've worked extensively with the young men to say, what else is it to be a warrior? Like, just talk to us. They were worried about not being able to be a warrior. And so we said, what does it really mean? And they said, it means to defend your community. It means to have status. It means to be seen as a, the guy to go to. And so we worked with Lion Guardians to develop this um, culturally appropriate warrior engagement program where we employ them to track lions, to chase lions away if they're getting close to households. So they get status. They get to learn how to do things like use GPSs. They go to Kenya every year. They're really come skilled and we said but what else would give you status we can give you money every month but how do we really achieve status and they said to learn how to read or write that's the thing that would really set us aside and so all these warriors we've now trained 17 of them locally and they are numerous and they're literate and it really is amazing to see that everyone now is wants to be you know a lion defender wants to get these kind of benefits and in particular the women have come to us and said our daughters now want to marry lion defenders because it's really they recognize that these men are the ones who are really having that status so that's really exciting. For improving conservation awareness, we take people into the park because even though everyone was living within 30 kilometers of the park, they never get to see wildlife in a positive you know, way. They don't get to see the park because they don't have a car or they don't have money to be able to get in there. So we take them in and the number one thing that we hear is that they didn't know lions could be gentle. When they see them with their cubs, when they see elephants playing around, it really transforms people's views of these animals and really changes it. We also show educational DVDs People walk for miles to come and see these. And it's something that we're really keen on working with the big organisations, Disney, Nat Geo, because a lot of the films that we show are in English. And while they're still lovely to see, we keep saying to them, these films need to be in local languages. These are the people that will determine whether these are the last lines. If you show a film that's not in someone's local language, it clearly gives the impression that this story is not for you. This is not your narrative. We have to really sort of go against that. So we started on a very small scale addressing that um, ourselves. We wrote a book called Dara and the Lion Defender, which is basically the Barabag in particular were worried that they were never represented anyway. So this is the first book where it's a um, storybook we're aware of that, that mentions them and it's based around them. It tells the story of the project by the view of a, a Barabag boy. And it's just a really important way. It's in Swahili and English. So it's given to all the local schools. And it's just another way of showing that they are central to the story. We we're really focused on building Tanzanian capacity. We went from the three of us to a team of over 70 people. And we know that we've had success in the core area. The depredation, so the attacks um, from carnivores have been reduced by over 60 percent. And the carnival killing, most importantly for us, was reduced by over 80 percent. So we were really we knew that we could do something on this kind of scale. And we've really changed from being these sort of people that people would run away from to being a valued part of the local community. It is not flawless, it's endlessly ups and downs, but it really has come a long way from people used to hide from us in the bush. But we need to do so much more. We need to scale up what we're doing in Oaxaca and we need to go far beyond. I showed you how much lions were declining and how fast. Lion numbers have halved in 20 years, nearly half in 20 years. So we have to be able to scale up quickly. We can't spend 10 years on every project so sort of doing this thing bit by bit, we have to pool our knowledge and work together. And that's where we really need to rely on each other. We are currently expanding our work into the Salu landscape, this biggest lion population left in the world. It's daunting. And how are we going to do these kinds of um, sort of scaling up? The only way to do it is to really collaborate with other people and to amplify our work through trusted collaborations. And this is where these women have been incredible. They are five of the most passionate and amazing and inspirational women that I'm privileged to know. And all of us were running lion conservation projects. And we were all talking and we found out that over time we were having exactly the same issues. We all felt isolated. We all felt we didn't have the tools we needed, that we didn't have any voice really, that we couldn't 
advance the scale and the pace that we needed. And so we thought rather than trying to do things and reinvent the wheel in each site, let's work together and let's scale this up properly. So we decided to join forces as the Lion, Pride Lion Conservation Alliance. And this has really been transformative for us. It really, the part of it is that we trust each other and we openly share our successes with each other so we can learn from them, but really important, we share our failures. So we don't have to waste time trying something that somebody else says, well, actually, you know, we've tried that before, it didn't work. You know, we can learn from those failures without going through um, all of that process ourselves. And it just gives a springboard. It's very hard to, to know where you access failures because you don't see them published in the literature. So if we've got a group of people who face the same challenges as we have, we can learn from them and make our own work much, much better. It enables us to share approaches at scale. So for instance, our community camera trapping, we're now trying in sites in Kenya and in Mozambique. Um, the work that Lion Guardians has been doing with this Lion network, um, Lion identification network of collaborators. Uh, if anyone's ever wondered about it, the way that you identify lions is through these whisker spots. And it's something where we can pull all of our pictures and images and knowledge of lions to help test this kind of thing at a bigger scale. And things like the Lion uh, Guardians, working with them to use all of their expertise to help us develop that kind of approach with the Barabag, a new sort of tribe that we were working with there, was so important so that we can really sort of help uh, strengthen our work together. We found through this that we started sort of working together to overcome barriers for women in conservation. This wasn't really intentional. We were focused very much on our lion work. But I remember going along to this Explorers Festival for Nat Geo, and I just had this baby, Rufus, who's screaming next door. Um, he's he was about 10 days old at this point and I didn't give any thought I went and I gave the talk and I walked on stage and it was ridiculous because this was an amazing festival and there were people who had gone to the top of the world and the bottom of the oceans and the most tweeted image from the festival was this one and the woman holds baby and I was like how is that possible like we need to normalize this so much more and this is true across pride not all of us have children but many of us who do are thinking about how on earth do you balance your life and your your wider life with say your conservation work and particularly with things like having young babies and managing lots of field work and things so it opened up lots of conversations at that explorers festival we ended up having this huge conversation about it and many of the young women in particular said i always felt i had to choose between going and doing this fun exciting field work or being a mother and that isn't the case at all and not only this just doesn't um, apply to women this is about families in conservation so pride has been incredibly important for showcasing, um, sorry, some sort of weird power cut. Anyway, we're back going. Um, so it's like in the bush. Anyways, this is a way just of us sharing our expertise. What is it like being pregnant in the field and worrying about giving birth, you know, thousands of miles from good hospital care or, you know, how you deal with having your families and managing all of these kinds of things. So it's really, really important for us to be able to share our expertise. And it's a really crucial network for support in general, just knowing that somebody else has your back. It can be really isolating working in conservation. So um, it's really nice just to know that you've got a network that you can trust with anything. You can be vulnerable, you can open up to them. And we are really focused within our programs of empowering women and girls through conservation. Uh, um, so for instance, these aren't the pictures of the actual women, so it's quite private stories. So I'm just sharing a couple of short stories about some girls that we worked with. So in our project, we had one of our students, our early Simba scholars, who was from just her and her mother. It was a single parent family. They were really very, very poor. Um, we ended up supporting her to get into the scholarship program. She then got raped. She ended up pregnant. She was told she'd have to leave school because that was the rules. So we worked with the local schools to make sure that she could actually switch schools, have her baby be supported through the pregnancy, come back afterwards and finish her schooling. And then she went on to the college program as well. So this was a really important way that um, just that people feel supported. We had another girl who, um, we had another girl who ended up being abducted and taken for a forced marriage. And she wasn't, wasn't really kept away from people because they thought she had no power. And eventually she got hold of a phone and she called the project because she said, you were the only people who gave me the confidence that somebody would listen to me. And so we worked with her, her families, the communities. She came back to school, she finished her education. And just knowing that you can empower people through this kind of on the ground action is really important. We need to go from that grassroots action all the way up to leadership. And through Pride, we have worked strongly at empowering local leaders in conservation, particularly women. So this is an amazing training we did about a year ago now in Kenya with 30 women's first women's conservation, African women's conservation leadership training. And this was 30 women from, I think 17 different countries and just amazing the passion we're still in touch with them all the time to sort of 
it builds that supportive network. We help each other out, everything from uh, from family issues to just how you, you know, you do your camera trapping, for instance. So it's a really supportive network, building leadership from the ground up. And that has led that some of the Pride uh, women have gone on to form Women for the Environment. This is such an exciting program where we're trying to reach out and build these supportive networks for women. And our project, Roja Carnival Project, and the Lanes Project have now decided to merge together as one program, Lion Landscapes, to really formalize that and to show that we are so confident in that collaborative model that we can scale up and we can achieve so much more together. This makes us now the biggest lion project in the world. We are working in Kenya, Zambia, and Tanzania. But we are still extremely grassroots, we are community driven, and we're very efficient. And it's worth noting today that it is run by two women and we're really keen all the time to, to promote women's uh, sort of, you know, sort of women's skills in conservation. And together we know we can build awareness of the need for lion conservation and we can build new resilience, things like the funding for conservation that we need. Uh, Elaine's great at innovative approaches to so things like lion carbon, where we know that there's a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. And we've worked with a great group called Biocarbon Partners who have this really top standard carbon offsetting where we are focused particularly on lion areas and the communities that live in them so that these communities are getting those carbon offset values, are getting paid effectively to keep their landscapes wild and to not destroy the habitat and to maintain species like lions. So it's all these novel financial mechanisms where you can go from this international value of lions that we've talked about right down to translating that to the local level. We are focusing more and more on how do we get more female staff in, more female interns, so that these people can be a role model in conservation. Women are still underrepresented in field conservation. We want to understand how we can empower them and how we can build them up so that they can become real leaders in this field. And ultimately, when you think about community conservation, I think people often think about this. They think about us working on the ground with local communities, and that's, of course, a key part of it. But it is so much more than that. These animals, when you're thinking about species like lions, are global heritage. They are our passion that people hold across the world. And if we are gonna address the challenges that face them, we need a global community to do that. So every one of us needs to play our role. And together we really can, if we put our heads together, if we trust each other, and if we're open to collaboration, we really, really can build a better future. And I'm so thankful to everyone I've worked with, both in the project and in Pride, for helping us really show that we are stronger together and to build us all up and provide that better future for both people and for wildlife. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Amy, and well done for navigating your power cut <laughs> amongst everything else. That was really, really fascinating and so interesting to hear just how integrated your work is um, with the communities and with the social structures um, in the countries you work in. And I know we've got a number of questions coming up about that. Um, so uh, we'll let some questions trickle in. Um, and in the meantime, I wanted to ask um, uh, just how much of your time you spend in Africa and how your time there is split between working with communities and working in the field, actually tracking lions and, and putting up camera traps and, and doing the kind of practical on the ground work. It's really, really varied over time. So at the beginning, it was often about eight months a year that we're spending in the field. Um, and that was predominantly, I would say, about 80 percent of the time was working with uh, communities and probably about 20 percent or less, maybe doing the sort of ecological and the slightly more, what I originally think was the more fun stuff, because that's what I went into it for, you know, really focused on wildlife watching and understanding the ecology. So that was kind of the split then. It moved for a long time to about six months in each place, um, especially once I started a family. It probably got to about four or five months in the field, broken up between um, between different fields, um, sort of sections, different field journeys over there. So it didn't tend to be those sort of six or seven months at a time. And obviously, as we grow the team, and we empower other people. We all have different roles. And so now I tend to go over for sort of three or four weeks at a time and, and sort of work with everyone. But the aim is to build up a, a team that doesn't really need me as much anymore. So it's changed quite a lot. But I would still say about 75 percent of our work is on community work and about 25 percent is on ecology. Yeah, OK, so it's um, it's it's very, very integrated, obviously. <laughs> Um, so yeah, a, a large number of questions have come in about about that um, that interface, I suppose, between the community work and and work with with the animals. Um, so I'm just having a quick um, scout through here. Um, so let's let's start with talking about uh, dogs. Erica has asked um, about 
whether you experience any inconvenience with dogs. And what she really means is the interactions between domesticated carnivores and wildlife carnivores, um, and particularly the situation of free ranging dogs, um, dogs that aren't in the, under the care of any particular humans and the diseases that maybe they bear. Definitely. So there are many things to point out with the domestic dog and presence of domestic dogs there. So that certainly there are a lot of dogs in that area. And we know that it's a risk for rabies, for instance, with the African wild dogs. There's transmission. We would often have uh, local dogs right by, say, the dens of African wild dogs. And that we know is a problem in terms of disease risk. So we've worked with vaccinating some of the local dogs against rabies, both as a public health uh, measure and to uh, sort of minimise some of those threats. We know that local dogs are used quite a lot for poaching. Um, and we see them often again on the camera traps if people are out poaching, they've often got two or three dogs with them. So there definitely is a negative interaction that can be between those dogs. When we worked on our livestock guarding dogs, we were obviously alert to some of those issues. So we have, they're all vaccinated, obviously. They are neutered so no one can breed from them and start their own kind of programs up. It all gets a bit crazy. And importantly, those dogs are actually not bred for hunting at all. They're not very good. They're not very active particularly, but they're very strong at guarding. They have a protective instinct. So we were trying to minimise some of those threats. Guarding dogs can still be a major issue for local wildlife. There are several studies that show it. But we were trying to minimise those threats and also work with local people regarding their own domestic dogs and how to minimise um, things like the disease spread and stuff like that. Mm, yeah, OK, so that, that forms a part, I suppose, of, of the programme that you work um, with, with communities on. Yeah. So um, Laura has been, uh, a different Laura to me, <laughs> has been uh, has been posting a lot about that, about that interface between um, between uh, communities and, and the project. Um, and she she asks um, whether there's a concern that the project is creating dependence between the project and kind of village subsistence. So how, how do you work with that? Absolutely. And this is one of the things we battle with all the time because we constantly get asked both by funders and numerous other people, you know, how sustainable is this? How how can we end up? Is this just going to be some dependent handing out program? Where we've got donor funding. And at the moment, to a large extent, yes, we're very open about the fact that right now in the situation we've got, we've got very, very poor local villages and all the value of Lions is held internationally and not locally. We have to somehow translate that down. And the current mechanisms we've got are ones that are fairly short term, I would say. But I think what it does is it holds back the pressures while we can develop more sustainable long-term funding. Things like, for instance, I would say the Lion Carbon, which are 30-year agreements with local communities to maintain habitat that is done through all of their local governance structures, that then that international payment comes in and actually protects wildlife and habitat in a way that communities choose themselves. Those are long-term solutions that are less of a handout and more of an economy. And we do want, we're constantly thinking about how to move forward with sort of wildlife-based economies, we talk about things like lion-friendly beef that we're working on, um, lots of different approaches. But right now, in the short term, given the decline of lions and other species, because those are things that aren't available at scale yet, we have to do what we can in the short term to do it. And for the next, I would say, 10 years, probably in these areas, we're going to be looking at a lot of these kind of stopgap measures where we have to have the international community put uh, sort of weigh in, and often through philanthropic endeavours to actually pay for some of this to happen. And I think that's we have to be open about that because we don't have other solutions to many of these places at the moment. Mm, yeah. And I, I wonder if um, if you've been working in this field for long enough that you've started to see the progression from, from the kind of philanthropic um, external model to starting to see how things might might grow up in the grassroots way. Definitely. We, we've absolutely seen that. And I think, though, that we shouldn't kid ourselves basically about the realities of how difficult it is to be out there with these very very dangerous animals for the vast majority of people who are living with lions in places like the village land where we work there is no advantage to having lions there so at least in the short term we as the global community if we want lions need to more than offset the cost of having those lions there for local people so and the philanthropy even though people often say well it's it's unsustainable it's fragile it's been fascinating to watch through COVID-19 because the philanthropic support has maintained these programs. All of us across Pride have managed to maintain our programs throughout all of it. It's not reliant on direct users in the same way that tourism or trophy hunting is. So I think actually it's making us recognize that philanthropy has quite a role to play in this. We don't want it to be the be all and the end all. It can't be as simple. There are many other mechanisms, things like rhino impact bonds, um, debt for nature swaps, restructuring of debt, to safeguard your own wildlife. There are lots of different mechanisms and we will need all of them and many more. There is not one or the other. We have to have locally appropriate solutions. We need a wide diversity of them because we are losing biodiversity at a startling rate and we have to be, we have to be innovative. 
Yeah, and I suppose that's that's um, that speaks to what you were saying about um, the uh, the large carnivores being showing showing that there's a, a, a wide range of biodiversity in those areas, mm -hmm. and they, they show the health of the of the area. Absolutely. Um, yeah, uh, Beth Bethan asks um, a really interesting question. So uh, this is about the kind of the the points based system. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I think she's she's uh, skimmed over the bottom picture, but she says with with the health, veterinary, and other community benefits being proportional to the points from camera traps, and mm -hmm. um, are there issues created between different villages or communities? So if if one village's area is naturally rich in more uh, in wildlife, um, and they earn more points and receive more benefits, is this unjust when all villages might be tackling the same issues in in social terms? Definitely. So, God, we have gone around around this and it's been an evolution over time a lot. But that was definitely one of our concerns at the beginning. We said it's not fair to put, you know, a really wildlife rich village by one that's, you know, 30 kilometres away and it's in some barren area with no rainfall. So it's never going to do well. So we tried, we've grouped them in groups of four villages. I didn't have time to go into how it all really worked. But then we've tried to put these groups of four as very similar villages, similar distance to the park, similar sort of ecology. So they've got a relatively good chance of, of scoring those points together. There are things we absolutely didn't expect to come up with this program. So, for instance, we were finding that when people put, often there are rivers and streams as the border between villages. And so people would put the camera traps there. And then there was these huge fights that people would say, well, actually, that camera trap is pointing onto our village land. So that in Parliament is not yours, it's ours. <laughs> and so we, those are our points. And so eventually we had to adjust it so that people couldn't put their camera traps within a kilometre of a village boundary to try to deal with that. Um, there are many different aspects we had to work really carefully and it's all credit to the to the teams on the ground that are constantly talking with the village leaders and talking with the communities about the transparency of this is a big thing understanding which benefits the communities really want um, trying to avoid things like obviously elite capture and corruption happening through it and and just making sure that that people are getting their needs met as much as we can through it even with those less wildlife rich areas and it's worth saying that the way that it works every three months that those villages compete against each other in each group of four. So the first village gets about $2,000 worth of community benefits, the next one gets 1,500, the next one gets 1,000, the next one gets 500. So they all get something and then they all reset again. And you know, we work with them to see how you could improve your points, whether it's things like setting some wild, you know, some habitat aside or dealing with the snaring or the poisoning. So it all is very locally specific, but it does involve a lot of work in trying to, to manage these and make it fair and responsive in terms of local community. Yeah, I can imagine it's, a, it's an enormous job and, and a constant conversation by the sounds of it. Um, so you've mentioned um, uh, trophy hunting a couple of times and, and there's quite a, a, quite a few people have picked up on it. So um, Sam's kind of, I suppose, given the kind of widest question. Um, so he says, given the scarcity of the large carnivores, why is trophy hunting an important part of, of, the, uh, of the income in the area rather than just looking at photo revenue? Definitely a really good question and one that I unfortunately am enmeshed in this debate. It's a very active one. It's worth, worth touching on. So the thing about trophy hunting, needing trophy hunting alongside the tourism is they tend to operate in different areas. So, for instance, around Rawaha, you have this huge protected area. Uh, the national park at the heart of it was the biggest national park in East Africa up until uh, 2019. And so the, even that park, it's about 20,000 square kilometres, doesn't receive nearly enough tourism revenue to cover its own costs. So it's already, you just don't have enough people there. Then you've got the same area about, about the same size again around it in these trophy hunting zones. And so if we expected those photo tourism revenues to somehow support double the area, it simply wouldn't be worth it. It wouldn't be worth it for the government, it wouldn't be worth it for local people. So in those other areas, it's just another form of revenue stream, often in the less charismatic, the less scenic areas, where it's another way that you can get revenue in. And it's undoubtedly highly um, contentious. You know, people, particularly in the West, don't like it. They see these pictures of people grinning over lion carcasses and things and think it's appalling. I think it's really important to note that it is a really complicated and that people often say, well, why don't they just have some of the hunting for meat and stuff, even with trophy hunting, and not have maybe lions on those quotas? But the issue we've seen in places like Namibia where I've worked, that if you take away the large carnivores from the hunting quotas, then there's no value to those animals there and they actually compete then with they you know they reduce the populations of prey and things so the hunters don't want to maintain them anymore so it's better to have a very low and regulated quota and very high value quota that provides an additional financial incentive to those areas so i think 
It's always more complicated than it first appears, but it is another revenue stream for protecting vast areas of wild land and wild species. And so until we have a better alternative, then we shouldn't get rid of it, you know, until we have better options, because we could do massive harm by doing that in my opinion. Mm, yeah, OK. And a number of people have asked questions about how how you include local local people in in matters of conservation. So, um, so Erica's question: From your own experience, how do you consider it to be the most effective way to include local people in conservation? And uh, considering what you mentioned about um, the range of distribution of the species not entirely covering uh, being covered by protected areas, so we mm -hmm. know that there will be species straying into into village land. Definitely. Well, I think the most effective way of doing it has been evidenced by places like Namibia, where you devolve the rights over wildlife use right down to the local level, so that if somebody owns a patch of land, they could also own and manage the wildlife on it, and therefore it is a resource for them. Because otherwise, if the animals, um, you know, I think it was Norton Griffith, which is just this amazing little sort of piece of talking about the wildlife, it's like having a goat, he said, that you have no value from, you can't milk it, you can't turn it into meat, you can't do anything. You only hope that somebody might drive past and take a photo of it and have a dollar or two. That's not an incentive for people to maintain wildlife on their land. They're going to want to maintain a resource, an asset that they can they can benefit from. And so I think if you can have wildlife be something that people can benefit from using their own rights and their own governance systems and devolve that power and control, that is the way I think of empowering people properly in conservation. It cannot be top down, it cannot be imposed, they can't be excluded from that. You know, people have a right to sustainably use their wildlife and people can do it very well when they're when they're empowered to do it properly. So I think that is the better way of doing it ultimately. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. OK, so um, just one last question from me before we finish, just to bring us back to uh, International Women's Day. I was really interested um, about what you said about the only time that you went against the, the elders' um, uh, recommendation and offering these scholarships to young women. Um, you said that eventually you got to a point where where there's a kind of equal number signing up but did that take a while to to come through and and what how, how did that work um, in the community and and what was the reaction to you going against their initial advice definitely it was something that we had these long discussions about they were very keen on the scholarship program we said we want them to right from the start we said we want half to be for girls and that really caused these issues and some villagers, they just really, they didn't want to engage in it particularly. There was one village, the one that we actually live really close by, where the leader, the village executive officer and the chairperson were both women. And so they were a little bit more engaged with this. And they said, OK, we can kind of see this. We worked with that school particularly to find the girls that could potentially go on and be these scholars. And it started with this piecemeal approach by one or two scholars coming through. And then those girls tended to do really well because this is a rare opportunity. They would work hard. And it just watching those girls succeed really changed the mindset of people were suddenly like actually you know those girls have now gone on and they might become a doctor or they might become a teacher and that maybe my child could do that and we've seen a, an increasing growth of interest in these programs even in the villages that really weren't keen and i remember being out there and this group of women suddenly appeared and they had this amazing little gourd this little um sort of beaded gourd for me and with six little eggs in it and they said each one of these eggs is one of the first girls that went through the Simba Scholarship Programme. They said, we wanted, you know, they have they have finished now and they've kind of hatched out. We wanted you to have these eggs just to remember, you know, that how you've helped sort of grow this thing. And I thought it was such a nice thing to see that they really valued it, the mothers of these children seeing a better future for their daughters. So it was a really inspiring journey for us to take with them. Yeah, fantastic. Well, I mean, w what a fascinating topic. And I can really understand why you've given so many years to, to trying to work with communities and, and, and work with lions. And, um, and, and I mean, it's just been so fascinating seeing the chat and seeing the debate that's raging in the chat. So these are all very, very big issues that you're dealing with here and, and that you're engaging with all the time in a really practical way, which is just fascinating for us to hear about. So thank you for, so much for sharing your work with us tonight um, and, uh, and uh, for celebrating International Women's Day um, and congratulations on your National Geographic Award. Um, uh, so I'll just say to everybody um, in the event, um, we will be posting the recording of this uh, lecture on our YouTube channel. Um, so you can just search for OUMNH, Oxford University Museum of Natural History on, on YouTube um, and you can find that and several other lectures that we've held in the last few months. Um, Amy, we're, we're so grateful to you for being here tonight and we hope
hope that you get to go off to Africa sometime soon. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was a real pleasure to be here.